Hello. Welcome back. Good to be back with you again this week as we continue to work our way through the book of Revelation. This week, uh, we are going to just spend time on chapter 12. Uh, and I said last week that now in beginning in chapter 12, we kind of begin like act two, I guess, of um, the book of Revelation. And now we're entering into some times of um, even more deep symbolic uh, language here. Um, and you'll find that is especially rich here in chapter 12. Um, and we're going to kind of work our way through this slowly and talk about some of the symbolism and the imagery that is used here. Uh, but bear in mind too, that really nobody has really the answers for what a lot of these things mean. A lot of it is, it, some of it is pretty plain, but some of it is just kind of, you know, conjecture. And um, so we're always open to suggestions and interpretation on this. This is an interesting chapter, I think, and it's really kind of one of my favorites. I think we've kind of confronted um, this before where we have like symbolism and um, visions and things, prophecies that can mean um, something in the near future or something past um, or and then have also implications for in the farther in the future. And, and I think we're going to see kind of a mixture of some of those things in this chapter. But the one thing that I want you to kind of keep in mind on this chapter now, chapter 12, kind of describes a war. Um, and of course, that's how it starts. A great um, war breaks out in heaven. Um, but it's, it's a messianic war. So we're talking about war that involves uh, the Messiah and uh, really God's plan for humanity. And we're going to be drawing on some Old Testament imagery on some of this too. But I, I want you to kind of think that what we're talking about now is this war that, that kind of starts at the incarnation of Christ and then um, extends to his second coming, which we're all still waiting for. We live kind of between those two great events, if that makes sense. All right, so I'm gonna start. Um, just I, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of um, go um, kind of chunk by chunk here and kind of talk about some things because it's a lot easier than reading it all and then trying to go back. All right, so chapter twelve, verses one and two. I'll start out reading and then we'll kind of uh, talk about those. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven: a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. All right, so we need to kind of talk about this, this woman and who she is. She's, she's clothed with the sun. So of course that, that means that it's radiant light, right? Um, and she's pregnant. She has the moon under her feet. I, I'm not sure, Olivia, did your commentary say anything about the symbolism of the moon? Um, no, actually. None of mine did either. Um, but then this crown here with 12 stars on uh, her head that she's wearing this crown. So Clearly, we see a woman who has been given an exalted position. Um, she's very important. And this crown that has 12 stars kind of gives us a clue on who she is. First of all, um, who is the woman? Um, and there are um, essentially kind of three possibilities. And really, I think three, all three work. And I think maybe she's all three at the same time. So first of all, as we'll see as we continue reading here, this is clearly Mary, the mother of Jesus, the human mother of Jesus. Second, I think she represents also the nation of Israel. Um, and that I think is symbolized with this crown with the 12 stars on her head. Of course, the 12 tribes of Israel, which we've heard referenced uh, here before in this book. And then finally, I think she represents the church. 
or the people of God. Um, and, and we'll see all three kind of come into play now as we continue. All right, will you read verses three and four, Olivia? Do you have anything more to say before we go on? Anything more to say on, on verses one and two? Yeah, I was good. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was like, wait, <laughs> I have something. Um, my commentary just says that she um, isn't a specific person or thing at all, rather than uh, it represents religious systems because women are often used as um, a sign of something like that. But it well, also then it also says that she represents Israel. So I don't. Yeah. yeah. And and I think we'll see that she represents Mary, too. I, I like that whole like re religious system thing that you mentioned, because certainly if if we talk about her as representing the church, of course, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. Right. And and that will figure importantly um, later in the book of Revelation, when we'll see a contrast between the bride and the harlot um yeah i didn't catch you asked earlier about the moon this does say something i just oh, didn't yeah. i was skimming because i'm not i don't have my notes because i'm not at home people um but it says the moon it, it ties it back to joseph's dream in genesis chapter 37 verses 9 through 11 which is how it explains the the crown um it says the moon that Joseph originally rep was represented as Joseph's mother, Rachel, and the 11 stars were the sons of Israel. Okay. So then the, now that the crown is 12 stars, now Joseph is among the tribes of Israel. Right. So yeah, that's cool. I guess, I don't know how that ties in to this portion with the moon under her feet, but my assumption would be that maybe that means that just confirming that Joseph is now a part of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, and certainly when we think about our feet, right? I mean, that's the thing that we stand on, right? So if, um, if the moon then becomes the basis of what she stands on, and if that's represented by Rebecca, who is the mother of Jacob, um, who later is renamed as Israel, then that that kind of becomes, then it, it solidifies here at this foundation of coming from the family of Abraham. So that's kind of the foundation of what this is built. And of course, um, the the Jewish people, the nation of Israel is is built on the foundation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel. And of course, the the Christian church is built on that same foundation because we come from that um, that line, that family tree. Yeah, it's weird that my commentary doesn't even talk about that part. It just talks, it mainly talks about who the woman could could be. Like there's yeah. just a lot of stuff. And she's really not. the central figure in this. And then it tells me that this is the sign first, the first of the seven. Um, that this great sign is the first of the seven. I don't know what that means, but then it lists out who everybody is in this chapter, who the woman, the dragon, the man, child, the angel, the offspring, yeah. the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. Right. So. Yeah, that would be in like 12 and 13. Yeah. Yeah. I All guess. right. Um, verses three and four now, chapter 12, yeah. please. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten thorns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. All right, so now we have this great red dragon. Um, and this is terrifying, has seven heads, 10 horns, and actually in the Greek, it's rather than seven crowns, it's seven diadems. A diadem is different from a crown. A diadem certainly remember, uh, uh, um, symbolizes a measure of authority, but not as much as a crown, if that makes sense. 
so it's kind of a lesser um so uh, but regardless i mean this is is um something that indicates that there is some authority here and some power and interestingly also this word this diadems this is the only place that it's used uh in the new testament that particular word it's only used in revelation so a crown represents like a permanent victory or a permanent um rule whereas a diadem represents kind of authority underneath the crown if that makes sense yeah this just says that he's claiming royal authority not that he yeah. actually has it right right so the dragon has authority and power but not complete power um because we see that um it's uh only able to sweep a third of the stars out of the sky so not all of them yeah and um then this this dragon now is poised to devour the child that the woman is about to give birth to so this dragon is an enemy of the child and um my we'll commentary that, says it's straight up Satan. Yeah, and verse nine. That the child. That. Oh, okay. And that yeah. the child is Jesus. So. Right. Right. All right. So now, if we move on then to uh, verses five and six, um, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to His throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. All right, so this, this child clearly um, is Jesus, right? This is a male child. And, and we know it's Jesus because later in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, when one is actually describing the, the second coming of Jesus, he uses that same phrase that he's ruling with an iron scepter or an iron rod. Um, so the child here is Jesus, who has been given birth to by Mary, but he's also born out of Israel, right? Because he's an Israelite, he's, he's Jewish. So that's why it kind of makes sense that she represents um, both Mary and Israel. Um, and, and we see this attempt to devour now um, many times in scripture when we look at the life of Christ, that the evil one is intent on destroying Jesus. This happens, you know, right after his birth with um, Herod, he uses Herod to kill all the babies in Bethlehem. That causes Joseph and Mary to have to flee to Egypt in order to save his life. He tried to destroy Jesus in the wilderness um, during the temptations so that Jesus could not fulfill his work. And then um, again at the crucifixion where people are essentially asking, you know, the same question that Satan asks in the wilderness, if you are the Christ, if you are the son of God. Um, so he's repeatedly trying to destroy Christ, but he doesn't. And then what happens then is that he's taken up um, to heaven, um, to God and his throne. And so um, he, yes, he dies, but he is not destroyed. So three days later, of course, he's raised from the dead and he's, he is, um, he ascends into heaven and there he is seeing. So he is seated. So we see a picture here now of Jesus' birth. Um, kind of a snapshot of his ministry, his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And Satan doesn't, he doesn't succeed in his attempt to kill uh, the child, to destroy. And so then the woman is taken to the wilderness. And the wilderness, of course, is seen as a place of refuge, it's not a place of danger. 
I mean, that kind of takes us back to like the Exodus, right? When the people leave, when they flee Egypt and they flee into the wilderness where they are provided for and taken care of uh, by God. So this is, is a, a place of protection and refuge. Um, and also then we see um, that Satan is, well, we're going to see here that he's thrown down from heaven. Um, I think that'll be, if we read verses 7 through 12, we're going to continue into that. So let me not get ahead of myself. Any thoughts or, or comments that you have, Olivia? Um, my commentary is very confusing well not confusing i just don't um it's just interesting um because it, it talks about how the fact that this woman gave birth then it can't represent the church because it references that jesus gives birth to the church and not the other way around so then the woman is either Mary or Israel. And it says that once we read the rest of Revelation 12, it demonstrates that the woman is Israel, not Mary. And one of their arguments is that how could Mary flee into the wilderness this way? And your your version said desert. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which wilderness, desert. Um, into a place prepared for her by God. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's 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 con confusing to me because to me the wilderness and the desert are two different things. Um and so if it but the wilderness is more of a place of um like you said, it represents um Safety. <laughs> Safety, refuge, protection. And keep in mind uh, like what area of the world we're looking at um, that this is taking place in. So for that area of the world, the desert is the wilderness. For us, it's not. For like where you are, the wilderness is um, probably, you know, the woods, Grace. mountains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and for me, it's like endless prairie. So it, it differs. The point is that yeah. it's important for us to remember that that's the place of refuge and protection. And, and she's taken care of uh, by God for a, a set amount of time. Again, let's not get caught up like like we, you know, we talked about last week, this period of 1,260 days. That's not a definite um, period of time. That's just kind of symbolic for that it is for a period of time that's determined by God, but it is not forever. It is just a, a period of well, time. Well, yeah, because it's not the place that she's meant to be. Exactly. Yeah. So, which is, it's interesting. They they talk about where the place could possibly be. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't even know where the place is. The rock city of Petra south of the dead sea i don't know where that would be yeah it's in um, present day jordan i believe okay um, i do like at the end this is where sometimes my commentary is just like it has stuff in it that doesn't seems like nonsense to me but then at the end it says that um if you refer back to john 14 verse 2 through 3 um the i go to prepare a place for you it talks about how this can demonstrate that God's careful planning works on earth as well as in heaven because it's said that the wilderness they refer to is in heaven for her to be safe from the dragon that's going to devour her child and because a lot a lot of people think it's a physical place yeah and I think we have to be careful about calling it a physical place I mean I think we have to decide when we're going to read the book of Revelation, are we going to treat some of these things as symbols or metaphors, or are we going to take them literally? And whatever we decide, then we have to stick with it. So if we're going to take some things no. literally, we have to take all of it literally. This is this is where my commentary 
is is just confusing because it says it's symbolic it's not like it's a sign but yet they mentioned that some people think that the actual wilderness is this place like i that it it just doesn't make sense to me right right to even to even mention it because it if it's not an actual physical place i think it's just symbolic that's how i tend to um to hold it here i i read this all as symbolism um so yeah i mean it's gotta be right all right will you read um verses 7 through 12 please yeah. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. All right, so war broke out in heaven. This, I think, um, is a key moment here that happens, that has happened. Um, you know, the conflict, um, of course, ramped up at the birth of Christ. Uh, and then when he was crucified and then triumphed over death, and was resurrected, resurrected, and then exalted, um, or ascended into heaven, then this is now the conflict. Now to understand this, this is where I said earlier, we have to go back to some Old Testament imagery, particularly in the first chapter of Job. In the first chapter of Job, you see Satan walk into the throne room of heaven. Um, and um, you know, ask God, have you considered your, your servant Job? You know, and God asks him, where have you been? What have you been doing? And he's been wandering to and fro. Um, so his primary job is to, up until that point was to, he had entrance, he had access to the throne room of heaven. And his job was the accuser. That's um, his, his, the name, Satan, means adversary so he is um like the prosecutor in a courtroom his job is to come in and accuse the people of god and he has had that ability to do that until jesus conquered and then what happens when jesus conquered and ascends into heaven is that satan now has lost his right and his job as the accuser of God's people in heaven. So he's thrown out. Michael, who is um, the chief of the host of heaven, of the armies of heaven, Michael does battle and throws Satan and his um, friends or those who are aligned with him, throws them out of heaven. And so Satan no longer has access. And that's why then we see that that kind of hymn that is sung. Um, now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. And, um, and, and he's been overcome then we're told by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony, which is their witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, so now he's, he's only, his only realm of operation is earth and he's mad because he's hemmed in 
and he knows his time is short because he knows once it gets to this point, then um, things, the, it's like the countdown now, the clock begins, the countdown to the end. And he has a short time, so he's vulnerable now. Um, we're gonna see him try and assert his power uh, later, and he'll do that in a couple of different ways, but it will be limited and it's not enough. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions or comments or thoughts from your commentary on that? I think the primary thing to know here now is that no longer is the accuser before us um, or before God in heaven. We're not being accused any longer there. Um, that that role has been taken away because Christ has been victorious over that. So I, or I compared it earlier to like the courtroom. So if you've got the prosecuting attorney who was Satan, and then you've got the defense attorney uh, who is Christ, every time the accuser comes and said, but you know, they did this and they did this and they did this and they did this and start listing off our sins. And then um, Jesus comes and answers each one of those and says, penalty paid, penalty paid, penalty paid, penalty paid. And then the judgment of God is not guilty because he sees what Christ has done for us. And so the accuser no, now has no, no place and no role uh, in, in the presence of the divine. His time there is over. All right, I'm going to finish the chapter by verses 13 to 17. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So this now is where the woman, I think, represents the church um, because um, he he pursues the one who has given birth to the male child um, but also it, it's clear that she has um, a, other offspring right who are siblings of this male child and that's of course how we're seen as siblings of of Christ, he calls us his brothers and sisters, right? So the dragon now where Satan is pursuing the woman, he's persecuting um, God's chosen people. And so the woman again uh, is taken to, we're told that she's taken to this place of refuge um, for a set period of time that's been prepared for her uh, um, by God, and she's protected there. The she that I'm returning referring to now is the church, um, and she's taken care of by by God um, during times of tribulation. That doesn't mean that we don't go through those times. It means that God is still in control and caring for us during those times of um, tribulation. And so Satan becomes frustrated and essentially doubles down uh, on his efforts and is continuing to persecute the church. And certainly we see that, right? Um, especially in areas that don't have the benefits that we enjoy here in this country, the freedom to exercise uh, our religion, our faith. Um, there are countries where it's illegal to do so, where you can lose your life for owning just a page of the Bible or for following Jesus Christ. Um, and that's all the work 
of Satan waging war against now the woman and her offspring against the church. And what we'll see is that he's not going to be victorious in that either because she, they are protected by God. And this only lasts for a time. Okay. Is that uh, any other thoughts or things to ask about here? No, my commentary okay. didn't do a really good job for this chapter. Yeah, that's kind of weird because they did, it did such a good job like at the, um, at the beginning part of it. So I'm kind of surprised they didn't pick up more of that at the end. Like the, it just went on forever about who's the Icar Archangel Michael, like, and it's, yeah, well, and it's Michael just is, nonsense. Yeah, Michael is a figure that has appeared throughout scripture in many places, predominantly in the Old Testament. We've not seen him too much in the New Testament. We see Gabriel uh, by name in the New Testament. Michael is kind of like the head of the of the armies of the hosts of heaven. Um, and, and he appears, of course, we saw him in Daniel, right? Um, he introduces himself um, as the protector of, of God's chosen ones. Um, it, was, it was just listing references of what you're talking about as to why Michael is not Jesus, as some people believe. It was a really long section. And it was kind of nonsense because obviously yeah. it's, it's not, um, he's not Jesus, obviously, yeah. if you yeah. even look back at the references. And then, right this last section it just goes on again about who the woman represents like it doesn't really give any insight into the text itself yeah i think it's i think it's kind of interesting in this chapter how we see the woman um and what she represents it kind of shifts uh with each kind of phase here right? initially the woman is clearly um israel and then the woman um, is clearly Mary, and then she's Israel again, and then she's the church. So uh, she really just kind of represents a lot here. But I think all of that is um, a very real, I mean, all of those have in common the connection to, to Jesus, right? They all have the connection to the Messiah. And the Messiah is from Israel. Um, the Messiah is born of Mary. Uh, and and the Messiah is the one who is the foundation or the bedrock of, um, and 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 the, the the body of the church, where the church becomes actually his body, uh, and then the church is victorious because of what he's done. I think that the key takeaway from this lesson is to remember and you know kind of keep our focus on on who's victorious in all of this, and it is the Messiah who's victorious yeah. we've, seen, we've seen you know blips of that here throughout i mean we go through kind of like these horrific scenes of things happening but then we're always reminded that god is victorious because of what jesus christ has done yeah i won't say that i don't care about who the woman represents but it just uh, i'm like this is intriguing is there really a great debate about who she is why can't she be both like what why does it why does it matter right like well, and, are you yeah. are there actually people who take strong stances and refuse to believe that you know i'm just like this the, they they could have just done more on the commentary and it's just kind of surprising because usually my commentary is good at stuff but it just felt kind of like disappointing yeah, like there could, they could have talked about more of the text itself and other right. things and they chose not to yeah, it's easy sometimes to get caught up in the nitty gritty details and miss the bigger picture going on here. And I think the bigger picture going on here is that the woman is always protected, that that the enemy or the beast never gets her. She's she's taken to a safe place um, and she's protected for, for a period of time. And that period of time will come to an end and then we'll see then how, how she's transformed because um, we'll see um, a woman appear later uh, in contrast to a woman who is not as virtuous. And, and we'll see the contrast here between, between the two. So, yeah. 
All right. Awesome. Okay. So next week we're going to um, look at chapter 13 into a little bit of 14 um, and um, start getting into some more like kind of um, scary kind of can be kind of terrifying images, but also um, once we once we kind of read through and, and understand what's going on and the symbolism that's happening, um, in my opinion anyway, as I've gone through this, makes it less, less terrifying, makes more sense. So that's just kind of a, a little nugget of hope there. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this day and for this time together. Thank you also for this good word for us and for the promises of hope that are contained herein, that you give us um, the promises that you are victorious, that um, we stand um, no longer accused, we stand uh, forgiven, cleansed, righteous, free because of what you have done for us through your son, Jesus. Be with us now as we go our separate ways this week. Help us to um, go out into the world sharing your grace, your love, your mercy uh, with those with the world that needs um, some hope and some encouragement. We ask this humbly in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, thanks for joining us, everybody. It was good to have you with us, and we will look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.